as long as the sun stays over here, I can go without my hat. Put this down, I've already broken something. Um, I chose Psalm 98 this morning because it's a celebratory psalm. It's a psalm of joy, it's a song of um, rejoicing in the salvation of our God, and it's a call for us to sing a new song. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, Psalm 98 at one point in time was a new song. And uh, the psalmist wrote it to express praise to God. And you can see in the reading of the psalm that the desire of the psalmist when the psalmist wrote it was that all of creation would join him in singing to the Lord. Praise for the salvation of our God. That's, that's another reason why I thought this was a great psalm today where here we are worshiping outside, and the desire of our hearts together as a small gathering of people is to give thanks to God for what he's done in people's lives, but also to realize that we would love all of creation to join in our celebration. When God works in people's lives, our singing and our vocabulary is not sufficient to enumerate all that God has done for us, to account for the sacrifice that Jesus has done for us. And it's interesting that one of the regular commands of the Bible, this isn't the only time it reads this way, the Bible regularly calls us to sing a new song. And um, as I say that to you and as I encourage you, I want to ask you the question, when's the last time you had a new song in your heart? When's the last time that you had a fresh song of joy in your heart? your heart. Regularly in the Bible, we are told that there is reason for a new song. Listen to this. Psalm 33, 3 says, sing to him a new song. Psalm 40, verse 3 says, he put a new song in my mouth. Psalm 96 says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalm 144 says, I will sing a new song to you, O Lord. Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 42, 10, Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastland and their inhabitants. When you get to the end of the Bible and you get a picture of worship in heaven, guess what's going on there? Revelation tells us in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. They're talking to Jesus. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. So over and over again, from beginning to end, the Bible says to us that we ought to sing a new song. I want to say to us that there's often times where we get familiar with the gospel. We get familiar with the story of salvation. We get accustomed to being with God's people. Worship in church can become routine. You can find your heart growing dull. And so singing a new song and having the command is a reminder to us that God is worthy and there is reason to sing new songs. I want to ask you just a little uh, question to think about this morning when God makes all things new and this psalm talks about that and there's a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more sin and brokenness and death and there is righteousness from sea to shining sea let's say a billion years from now will there be reason to sing a new song then and you and I need to think about that because God is infinite and we are finite And I think on a couple of levels at the very least, one, we will see the implications unfolding to us forever and ever. We read earlier in Ephesians chapter 1 about God saving us. And in Ephesians, the writer of the Ephesians says one of the reasons God saved us from our sin for himself is that he wants to show us his grace through Jesus Christ for all eternity. And so you and I are going to be tasting of the goodness of God forever and ever. And uh, I'm hoping that I'm musical, I mean really musical, um, that I'm not just, as this psalm says, making a joyful noise (laughs) to the Lord. But on those days, um, we will go, wow, 
Isn't it incredible what the Lord has done? We'll be going, can you believe that we're still here and it's still this way, not corrupted by sin, not tainted by death, never loneliness, never struggle? Aren't you going to, it will be beyond our language that day. And I would say to you that if God is glorious and what he's given to us in Jesus Christ, we will experience forever and ever is a basis by which we will sing his praises forever and ever. There's reason today to sing a new song to the Lord. Now, in this psalm, as the psalmist calls us to make a joyful noise to the Lord and calls not only people but creation to make a joyful noise and sing praises to our God, he gives us two reasons, two reasons we ought to sing a new song. Um, Basically, if you want to summarize it in the first part of the psalm, he says, because he's come. The first coming of Jesus the saving coming of Jesus, our salvation, which we've been celebrating today, is the reason for a new song for us to sing. At the end of the psalm, he says, based on everything he's done, we can be assured he's coming again. And the second coming, when he makes all things new, is the other reason why we ought to sing a new song. So I'm going to walk through this text of Scripture and point out to you Um, why we ought to sing a new song. And what I'm trying to do is, maybe for some of you, this will be the first time you sing in your heart of hearts a song of praise to God. And I hope that's true. That somehow the Holy Spirit just touches your heart and you sing a new song to the Lord. A song you've never sung before. It could be an old song like Amazing Grace, but you sing it like a new song. Uh, My other hope is that for some of you who have been tired and discouraged in your spiritual walk, that the Lord will unveil his heart to you, his purpose to you, his glory to you, so that you'll leave to your today with a new song. And again, it could be an old song that you know. It could, be a, a song, uh, it could be Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And you sing it like you've never sung it before, afresh. Um, I also hope and pray that as some of you are sitting here, uh, I did want to say to you that in the fall, we are going to be studying Ephesians and we are going to have an art and scripture uh, project again. We often ask all our artists to do artwork of any kind that will teach what's taught in Ephesians. So Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 is the theme verse. But my hope is some of you songwriters will write a new song. Some of you poets, some of you artists will write a new song. And that out of what God has done and who he is, that you would bring praise to the Lord. But let's go to this text of scripture. And um, can, I, can I tell you of another uh, new song that was new um, that came out of this psalm? You'll know this song. Uh, Isaac Watts studied Psalm 98 uh, a few hundred years ago. And he wrote a song that we sing at Christmas. Do you know the song he wrote? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth, right, sing it. Receive her king. Let every heart. And, the, and, and uh, a little later, you know, uh, not directly intended, Handel, uh, who wrote Handel's Messiah, his music was tied to Isaac Watts' lyrics. And so we have this great hymn. Um, I want to tell you that Joy to the World was not written for Christmas. It was written to be sung by God's people all the time, that they might celebrate that the Lord has come to save us and to change us. One of the lines that I love is, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Isn't that great with lyrics? Aren't you looking forward to that day when he makes all things new and the blessings flow as far as the curse is found in humanity and in creation? So um, Isaac Watts said, let's sing joy to the world. Now, here's why we ought to be joyful and sing a new song. The very first thing the psalmist writes here is, you and I always have to remember that salvation is a wonder of God. Look at Psalm 98, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done, what? Marvelous things, marvelous things. That word in the Hebrew, he has done marvelous things, is used to talk about miracles. Signs and wonders in the book of um, 
Exodus 34, when God is rescuing the people of Israel from their captivity, it says this. God says, Behold, I am making a covenant, speaks through Moses, before all people I will do marvels such as has not been created in all the earth or in any nation. That's the same word here. So as the psalmist begins to celebrate the salvation of our God, he says he has done marvelous things. Friends, you and I can be accustomed to God changing people's lives, but we shouldn't be. What happened today is a miracle. What was being testified by each of these people is miraculous. Um, Diana, you prayed it, wherever Diana is, that creation is a miracle. Uh, it's organized and it's designed and it's systematic and it's mathematical and there's gravity, but none of that is happening just because we made it happen or chaos. God orders all those things. But Diana, you prayed, there's a greater miracle than all we see in creation. It's sinful people being sons and daughters of the king. Ligon Duncan said, you know, sin doesn't amaze me, but salvation takes my breath away. Now, some of you today just need to stop and marvel that you're a Christian. You know your story. You know the background. You know how the odds were stacked against you. You know why you were the least reluctant person, or least likely the most reluctant person to come to Jesus Christ in your family. God says that he chose the weak to shame the strong, the foolish to shame the the wise, Uh, None of us stand here to boast that we're Christians. Um, It's a miracle that any one of us came out of darkness into light, out of sin into life and forgiveness and grace. And as we even watch little children who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, thinking of their family backgrounds, thinking of their personal stories, and you think, well, there's they're, they're young. They don't really know what life is like. My dear friends, when a young child gets drawn to Jesus Christ, we should rejoice. It's not a common thing. It's not a human thing. It's a God thing. And that's why I take it very seriously. If a young person comes and looks me in the eyes and says, I want to be baptized, I take the conversation seriously because I'm the last person to want to look at a child and say that what you know of the work of God is not real. If they know it's a miracle, if they know God has changed them, if they testify that, I want to worship with them. I want to rejoice with them. But the testimony of all of us is that salvation is a wonder. Are you guys amazed that God has worked in your life? Isn't it good news? And it's a wonder, not simply because where it starts, but where it goes. It's a marvelous thing. Uh, We also need to see in this that salvation is not only a wonder of God, it's a work of God. Look at the text. It says, His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. We're very careful when we talk to people about baptism and getting saved that we listen to say, to hear them not say, I'm getting baptized today because I fixed myself. Or I figured it out. Uh, they are saying they're following Jesus. But we're listening to see if they realize that, as Jonah had to discover, salvation is of the Lord. And that the whole process of salvation begins and ends with the miraculous work of God. You know, Martin Luther testified that if God hadn't rescued him, he tried. He did absolutely everything he could to fix his life, to get the guilt gone, to straighten, get walking on the straight and narrow. And as much as he tried, the harder it was. The more he saw the holiness of God, he saw the depravity of his own sin. And he came to the conclusion, which Paul says in Ephesians, salvation is by grace, through faith. It is a gift of God. And God adopts us. That's what we read today. He brings us into his family. He seals us with the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that when we talk about salvation, we echo the words of Jesus? 
when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3 and said to Jesus, how shall I enter the kingdom of God? Jesus didn't say, keep trying. Yeah, he didn't look at him and say, well, you're a scribe and, or a Pharisee. You're ahead of everybody else. He said, you must be what? Born again. And he didn't say born again physically. He said born again of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has to give you life. And he gives you the kind of life that responds to the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for your sins and rose again. He gives you that life so suddenly it doesn't become a religious construct. It becomes a personal relationship, a personal reality. And that changes the way you sing, right? And God has done marvelous things. He has worked salvation with his hands. You know, if you read the Bible, you will understand Israel was a disaster. And if you read that, you'll also find yourself in Israel. So Paul, who is one of the most devout religious men of his day, said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all, like sheep, echoing Isaiah, have gone astray. And uh, I'm thankful. When I read the Bible, I go, wow, David was a mess. Jacob was a mess. These people were messed up. But in the middle of it all, there was a promised king, a Messiah, a deliverer who would come. God never failed to keep his promise. And so not only is it a wonder of God, it's a work of God. Can I ask you the question today, is God working in your life? Is God working in your life, opening up your heart, showing that you need Jesus, calling you to turn to him? Praise God. He loves to do those kinds of works. Notice also in this text of scripture, it's a word from the Lord. The Lord has made known, verse 2, the Lord has made known his salvation. So it's a wonder from the Lord. It's a work of the Lord. It's a word. He's made known his salvation. And so all the way through the Bible, God speaks. He speaks clearly. He reveals to us he's the God who made the heavens and the earth. He's good. Aren't you glad he's good? His goodness is in all that he's made. But we're not good since Adam and Eve. And so God has spoken promises. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, he, he gives his word. Uh, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Sin will not have the last say. That was a great promise. When Abraham, shortly after Genesis chapter 12, is in a godless culture, and he's called out of Ur of the Chaldees, God says to Abraham, through your seed, the nations will be blessed. All the nations, like the sand on the seashore. And when God said that to Abraham, he had Hudson Campbell at his sight. When God said that to Abraham, he had Hazel Campbell in his sight. And he said, Abraham, a descendant from yours, is going to save the nations. Do you realize when he said those words, we were about as far geographically as we could. We are the ends of the earth. Said Peter Voss, Lynn Voss, Audrey Campbell. Abraham, your seed is going to save them. He said to David, David, you're going to have a descendant, a son, and that son is going to reign on my throne forever and ever. And in David's city, over a thousand years later, there was a child born in Bethlehem. And that child was David's descendant. Biologically descended, miraculously descended, and he was the promised one who died, came and lived and died and rose again so that God's salvation would be delivered. And so this is the word the, the Lord has spoken. He's announced his salvation as he saves people today and as people give their testimonies. He again announces to us, if anyone would turn to me, if you would seek him, you will call on me. You can be found today. You can be long to the Lord. That's the message. The message here isn't simply that this is where it stops and ends. This is an invitation. God has announced in the coming of salvation that he forgives sinners. 
that he's paid to make the unrighteous righteous, that you can come to him today. Do you hear that voice? If you hear that voice today, you'll sing a new song. We sing a song that God saves the unworthy, that God befriends the unfriendly, that God exalts the humble and the nobodies, and God invites you to come to him today. Uh, when I was meeting with Audrey the other night, and I do this regularly, I say, when you testify in baptism to what God has done in your life, pray that somebody else will share that blessing in their lives. Pray that they'll hear of forgiveness and salvation, and they'll be amazed. And uh, I also want you to see in verse 3, that when we sing this new song of salvation, not only is it a wonder of God and a word from the Lord, or a work of God and a word from the Lord, but it's a welcome from the Lord. Look at the end of verse 3. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation. When God was working in the Old Testament and bringing Israel to itself and promising them a Messiah that, that Eve and Adam's seed would crush the head of the serpent, when Abraham's descendants would bless all the nations, when God was doing all of that, God's intention was that the ends of the earth would hear and be saved. And when we read that, he's talking about the non-Jewish Gentiles. And uh, that excites me because what Psalm uh, 98 tells us is one of the reasons we worship and sing with praise to God is we know that even as we exult in, E-X-U-L-T, exult in and exalt Jesus, E-X-A-L-T, that what God intends is that as we celebrate salvation, as we honor salvation, as we proclaim with joy, God is going to bring people from every tribe and tongue and nation to himself. Uh, that plan was not to end here. That plan was to go to every tribal group, every ethnic group, to the ends of the earth. And God has been doing that. God has been saving people. He's been saving people here. He's been saving people in tribal groups. He has taken away that, that, that long history of one nation struggling in its relationship with God, always had in it the seed promise through Abraham that all the nations would be blessed. I think that should excite us. Every time we hear the story, see, I feel, I feel like sometimes we have this very narrow North American mindset. And we listen to the news too much, and we get depressed because we think the world is falling apart and it's all bad news. And one of the dangers with all of that is we don't know the stories of how many people are finding Jesus at the ends of the earth. A few weeks ago, we had visitors that were from Iran who had gone out through Turkey and came to the United States who had found Jesus. Uh, I have friends who contacted me and said, we need help. Can you connect us to with leaders in Toronto because there are so many Syrian Christians come, that were coming out of Syria through Greece into Canada? They said, we have so many people that have come to Christ, we can plant a church just among refugees. And you and I need to stop thinking that our little church and our little experience and our little culture is the end of the story. It just goes that we haven't seen. We haven't listened. The, the message is going out. The message has gone out. The message will keep going out. That's what propels someone like Carice to go into Italy and to pray by the grace of God that through the testimonies and the rescuing, we will continue to hear the story of men, women, and children streaming to God. Is that a good reason to write a new song? To sing a new song? Every time somebody's saved. Every time the gospel advances, we rejoice. But here's the other thing at the end that one day he's coming again. And my dear friends, I want to be part of that choir. I want to see that song. Look at Psalm 98 at the very end. 
after he calls out for all these trees and every people uh, and and creation to make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth let the verse 7 let the sea roar and all that fills it let the rivers clap their hands let the hills sing for joy before the Lord he comes to judge the earth he will judge the world with righteousness and the people's with equity he will judge the world with righteousness there's a day of judgment coming for all of humanity you when you think about that you think why would that be a song of joy well let me at least say this there are a lot of you who have suffered injustice in your life and part of the ache of living in this life is that there are some wrongs in your life that will not get rectified that's what Ligon Duncan said he said, there are, there are aches in our lives that will not be rectified in this life. But God will make it all right when Christ comes. He will resolve all of that. And so every one of us, it says, is appointed to die and then face the judgment. That's true for all of us. Now, that's bad news if you want to stand on your own righteousness. Because no one will survive that trial if they're standing on themselves, clothed in their own experience, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news of the gospel is you don't have to stand in your own righteousness. You can hide yourself in Jesus, the great exchange, the one who took your sin and died in your place. He took judgment. Judgment has already happened. John 3 says, Christ said, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through me. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The good news to every person that got baptized is on the judgment day you have a mediator in Jesus Christ. Someone who stands up in your place and says justice is satisfied, their sins are forgiven, the payment is paid. Isn't that good news? I mean you have sing sing about that for all eternity. But it also says not only is that justice been paid, but it says he will reign in righteousness forever. We groan when we watch what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine. When we see tyrants and tyrannies where people are driven by ego and power, they're capricious and unkind, they're cruel. It's hard to watch the news and see egos competing with egos, injustices happening regularly, but one day they'll be a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess what Jesus is Lord and he will reign in righteousness there'll be no more competing there'll be no more egos there'll no be pride no more pride there will be one reigning over all things who is the truest king and the greatest friend he's the friend that laid down his life for you That's the way his kingdom will be. A king who sacrifices and serves, not makes everyone else suffer under his tyranny. On that day, there'll be no more sin. All his enemies will be put as a footstool for his feet. Sin will be done with. Tyranny will be done with. Injustice will be done with. Death will be done with. I I know on that day, we will be more relieved than we've ever realized as we've lived in a fallen world. And on that day, we will weep and rejoice and thank God that we'll never have to do that again. Isn't that good news? My dear friends, we're here to celebrate. A Savior who forgives, a Savior who changes lives, a Savior who offers a warm and long and welcome to anyone who will come to him, one who is determined to end sin injustice and death forever if anybody ought to sing a new song it ought to be us so let's pray that God would give us a new song in our hearts let's pray together heavenly father on this beautiful summer day we do cry out that all of creation the trees the hills the rivers the streams would rejoice that one day the curse is going to be removed and he will make all things new So we just pray, dear God, would you do that work in our hearts? Change us, for Jesus' sake. Uh, Make it so that we hear the word that's being offered in salvation. If 
If you gave your son for us, you will receive us if we come humbly. Not because of our perfect life, but because of his. Not because of our perfect obedience, but because of his. Not because of our sinlessness, but because of his sacrifice for sin. So give us a new song. Give it to us today. Let us sing and sing and sing for joy, because Jesus is coming to reign. Thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.